happen. Now I ask you, is he any good? Our Don Bradman, as the batsman, he is certainly plump Take and I would meet their fate, for it's always shut the gate. Who has won our very highest praise? Now is it Amy Johnson or little Mickey Mouse? No, it's just a country lad who's bringing down the house. Our Don Bradman, now I ask you, is he any good? Our Don Bradman, what a welcome waits for you back home. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> the Honourable John Brown, Minister for Sport, Recreation, Tourism, and Patron of the Sport Australia Hall of Fame Selection Committee, Mr. Les Martin, President of the Confederation of Australian Sport, Sir Hubert Upman, Chairman of the 1985 Sport Australia Hall of Fame Selection Committee, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. You probably all realise by now why all of you are enjoying this function so much more than I have been. <laughs> so I knew what was coming. At least I've been spared the problem I didn't have to kiss the minister when I came up for my medal. <laughs> Now, several years ago, I resolved not to make any more public appearances of this kind, but I reckon without the ingenuity and persuasive powers of Sir Hubert Oppenman and his colleagues, Sir Hubert says that at my age, you don't get retired, you only get retreaded. <laughs> That's very appropriate for a cyclist, but it doesn't fit quite so comfortably for a cricketer. Some of the young fans who write to me for autographs been trained in diplomacy as you have, Sir Hubert, are much more brutal in their assessment of advancing years. One lad said recently, I am writing larger than I normally do because I understand you don't see very well. <laughs> <laughs> but a much more ominous note appeared in another letter when the boy added, I am sorry this request comes so late, but I would always regret it if it came too late. <laughs> connotations of those statements are obvious. Now to be serious. <clears throat> I stand before you today not only in a personal capacity but also as a symbolic figure because I have been accorded the honour of representing the initial 120 inductees of the Hall of Fame. I think the reason I was chosen was because I come closest to a bridge between the living and the posthumous. <laughs> But on behalf of each and every one, dead or alive, I express thanks to the Confederation of Australian Sport for what they have done and are now doing to assist and encourage Australian sportsmen and sportswomen and for this tangible record of achievement. I'm sure all inductees will feel a great sense of pride in having been selected. And I think a special tribute should be paid to the Hall of Fame Selection Committee whose task of evaluating sporting prowess must have been very daunting. In fact, I think even worse than that facing the current Australian cricket selectors. <laughs> the first time I was chosen to represent Australia was in The same selectors dropped me from the 11 a fortnight later. And at least, Sir Hubert, you can't do that to us. We're all in for life <laughs> and even beyond. Special thanks must go to the Commonwealth and Victorian governments and to the Melbourne Cricket Club for their generous financial contributions which enabled the concept of this Australian Gallery of Sport to become a reality. It is now part of Australia's heritage and will chronicle a permanent record of the country's sporting history. I understand that the Melbourne Cricket Club has the task of managing the Gallery of Sport and I'm confident that this organisation will faithfully discharge such an important trust, initially under the guidance of my friend, Dr John Lill, a fine sportsman himself Here in many spheres. My boyhood days were during a period when governments did not feel any obligation in the sporting arena. And I thought perhaps a couple of my early experiences might be of interest and perhaps put in some perspective, 
the change that has come over attitudes to sport during the last 60 years. They may also help modern sports people to realise how fortunate today's youngsters are. As a lad of 16, I had a great ambition to play cricket for the senior team in my country town. But the nearest I could get at first was to be scorer. That presented no problem because my best subject at school was mathematics and I could always add up faster than any of our batsmen could score runs. <laughs> However, it involved travelling on a Saturday up to 40 miles over rough metal roads seated on a wooden kerosene box in the back of an old international truck shod with solid rubber tyres. Despite the discomfort and having to eat my breakfast off a mantel shelf next morning, it paid dividends because one day a player was absent and I was given a place in the 11. A couple of decent scores led to my selection in the Sydney first grade side. Now this meant getting up at 4.30 a.m. on Saturdays, walking half a mile carrying my kit to catch a train for the three hour journey to Sydney, and after playing in the match that day, which sometimes meant just fielding the whole afternoon, I caught the train back to Barrow, arriving home at midnight. My total financial reward was reimbursement of my train fare. But that didn't worry me. My goal was simply the honour and privilege of wearing the baggy green cap of Australia. In those days, there was no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Indeed, for a test batch, the fee was £25, irrespective of how long the game lasted. I played in one here at the Melbourne Cricket Ground, which finished on the eighth day. <laughs> but money was irrelevant. I would have played quite happily for nothing. How times have changed. And when considering the stature of an athlete, or for that matter, any person, I set great store on certain qualities which I believe to be essential in addition to skill. They are that the person conducts his or her life with dignity, with integrity, with courage, and perhaps most of all, with modesty. These virtues are totally compatible with pride, ambition, and competitiveness. There are plenty of examples of these standards of excellence, not least being the inspiring life story of America's fabulous golfer Ben Hoven and his triumph over adversity. About a century ago, that distinguished Englishman John Ruskin wrote, I believe the first test of a truly great man is his humility. And significantly, England's former Prime Minister Lord Baldwin once said to me, the want of humility is usually more common in the second rate than the first. A most penetrative observation which fits in with my own experience. I love to see people with personality and character, but I reject utterly the philosophy of those misguided individuals who think arrogance is a necessary virtue. It is neither. It is only endured by the public, not enjoyed. Inevitably, over the years, there have been occasional examples of bad sportsmanship. Happily, I feel such behaviour is on the decline. I hope this may be due in some measure to coaches, who now appreciate, perhaps better than they once did, that their role is not only to encourage and improve athletic skill, but also to mould citizens who will be a, a credit to society and who will add to our nation's standing and reputation in all parts of the world. And don't forget that a sense of humour is a much more valuable asset than a fiery temper and, give, and can give a great deal more pleasure. In 1938, Australia played England in the fifth test match at the Oval. England's wicketkeeper was Arthur Wood, a very dour Yorkshireman. When Arthur came into bat, the score was 770 for six wickets. <laughs> He made 53, and he got out when the total was 876 for seven. As he walked up the pavilion steps, a men member said to him, well played, Arthur. He looked around and retorted, thanks. I'm always at my best in a crisis. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And I think perhaps time might let me tell you another Yorkshire story, which is even more subtle than that one. <laughs> a chap named Clark played cricket for Somerset. In his whole career, he batted nine times and never once broke his duck. <laughs> one day they were playing Yorkshire and the great left-hander, Wilfred Rhodes, who took more wickets in first-class cricket than any other man who ever lived, got Clark out, naturally for a duck. And as Clark walked past him on his way off the ground, Wilfred said to him, glad I got you when I did. You were just getting on top of me. <laughs> Now let me close, Mr Chairman, by saying that whilst I applaud our government's newfound encouragement for the sporting fraternity, I hope nobody gets carried away by the mistaken notion that financial help and good facilities guarantee success. They merely open the door. Success must still be motivated from within. Hard work and dedication remain essential for all individuals who must embrace with equal fervour, opportunity and responsibility. So in expressing our gratitude, let us remember that athletes who deserve and receive recognition also have a duty to mankind. May the people honoured by this Sports Federation, both now and in the future, so conduct themselves that they will prove worthy of having had their names recorded for posterity.